Greetings, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Open Rights Group Oxford event. We're doing tonight Digital Security Lightning Talks. My name is Mike Morell. I'm the Campaigns Manager at Open Rights Group. And I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of this event. Originally, it was um, a crypto party that was being held, scheduled back in March, I believe it was, um, in Oxford. And we had a really great uh, selection of speakers um, at a cafe in Oxford where they were gonna talk about digital security. And we had some workshops set up. And then of course the pandemic came along and we almost held the event, but we literally had to cancel it on the day because the lockdown was imminent and it just didn't feel right. So we, we paused the event. And since then we've sort of um, pivoted to online. And so we decided to uh, carry on um, with part of our lineup. However, um, because we're online now, we can't, it's difficult to do actual workshops. So instead of doing the workshops, doing a sort of a proper crypto party, we sort of transitioned and instead we're doing a series of lively lightning talks. So all about digital security. Um, unfortunately, tonight um, we were supposed to be joined um, by our Org Oxford um, organizer, Joe, who was going to facilitate the evening, um, but he ran into some technical issues, unfortunately couldn't join us, so he sends his condolences. We, um, we miss you, Joe, not staying without you. Uh, instead, I'll be sort of facilitating uh, the evening. So the way it'll work, it's going to be a kind of a quick fire round of talks. Um, so I'll introduce our three speakers shortly, and each one will speak for about 10, about 15 minutes, and then they're going to have, um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. So. Um, you have an opportunity to submit questions via the question panel on your uh, GoToWebinar control panel there. So go ahead and uh, feel free to send questions. I recommend keeping them concise. There are a lot of attendees on the call, so it's a bit difficult to, um, for us to take in really long questions, try to be concise, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, it'll be a short period of, of questions, but we'll do our best to answer those questions. Um, and I, I want to let everybody know we're going to be um, recording this event as well. So we'll post a copy of that um, event um, sometime tomorrow. I and mean, in the next 24 hours, we'll post it on our, our YouTube channel. Okay, great. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. We'll get started. We'll jump right into it. So up first, we have Prof Professor Bertrand Bernard, who's from the Oxford Internet Institute um, at the University of Ox Oxford. And he's leading an EU cybersecurity project. And the aim is to understand uh, the cybersecurity behavior of students. And he's gonna describe his research about the determinants of cybersecurity behavior. And that title of that talk is Why I Don't Care About Cybersecurity. Uh, after that, we're gonna hear from Iman Alashwali. She's a doctoral student at Oxford University. And she'll be discussing her research on negotiation, transparency, and consistency in configurable security protocols. I don't understand what that is, I look forward to hearing about it and trying to understand it. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, we're going to hear from uh, Conrad uh, Kolnig, who is a computer scientist, uh, and he's also a PhD student at Oxford University. And his research is about corporate surveillance, particularly on smartphones. And he's um, developing an app um, called Tracker Control. And what that does is it um, helps control smartphone surveillance and also that, um, teaches you about um, individual uh, protection rights, data protection rights. So we're going to see a, a little bit of the app and hear about that. Um, Conrad's calling in from, from Germany. Everyone else is in Oxford. I'm in London. So thanks uh, to everyone for joining us tonight. And thanks for everyone who, who's um, in the audience. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Bertrand. Hello, good evening. And uh, as you say, Mike, uh, my talk is going to be about uh, answering a question why I don't care about my cyber security. I mean, it may be something that could have been said to us during the interviews, and uh, because we have done interviews for this research, uh, when we could have met a student, and we did, and we could have said to us, why I don't care about my cyber security, I'm going to explain to you, and what I'm going to share with you is a, a brief description of our finding when we interview students. I mean, this project, as you mentioned, it was um, is um, uh, 
funded by the EU is a number 792137, and then it's cybersecurity. And the main question we, we, we have, have in this uh, research is what are the determinants of the cybersecurity behavior? And basically it means how could we explain that people protect or don't protect themselves when they are on the internet, when they use their computer or their smartphone? And to do so, we have um, um, uh, designed a, a research which is uh, in, in various steps. And um, if you are familiar with research, that's quite obvious uh, research design. And we start with the management of the, of the project, then a literature review, which basically means that we read all the, or a lot of articles and books, but mainly articles about the topic. And in this case, uh, it's interesting to mention now that we had um, a part of the research which was done in France and another one which was done in the UK. And basically what we did in this step three and step four it was to interview students in the two countries. Then uh, we have already done the step five but I'm still working on the step five which is a quantitative phase and it's basically a survey questionnaire sent to uh, uh, students to people in organization and various types of people actually and uh, in various languages in order to again uh, answer to the question what are the determinants of cyber security behavior and of course the research dissemination is publishing articles and, uh, and speaking in conferences in terms of interviews we are talking here of a very very large research project because only in the UK, we did uh, 58 interviews, I mean, actually more, but uh, I'm going to share with you the finding of the 58 interviews. But there were also quite a lot done in France, in a French university, in two, uh, uh, what is called Grand École, it's type of uh, result group uh, type of university, which are called Grand École in France. And the total of interviews uh, was 167 interviews of students, which is enormous. There were another 77 interviews being done, but if you only consider the 167 interviews, it's really massive. And you, we got plenty of qualitative research based on 15, 20, 30 students. However, it's still uh, a qualitative research and it's still exploratory in looking for, uh, for answers to a question that I shared to you previously. And of course, uh, this research uh, uh, is follow uh, uh, by, by the university, there is a, a, a correct it's a system in the university to make sure that the, our research are done accordingly to ethical, strict ethical uh, guidelines and rules. And when we do qualitative research, and uh, basically we do interviews and we have transcriptions of the interviews. And once we have the, the transcription, uh, we use some software and we do also manually some coding to find out key concepts uh, in the in the transcript, but what I'm going to share just right now is the key findings, which are in fact the most frequent um, um, description or explanation by students of the fact that they protect themselves, or sometimes they don't protect themselves. And um, and then what I will share with you is some uh, typical verbatim, and by verbatim I of course mean um, uh, a few words they have shared to us when we were asking questions during the interview process. First, uh, we have cyber security behavior, which are quite often in the literature uh, um, uh, stressed as being a really high risk for people, for organization, and for countries. And we have plenty of examples of people not having, having done what they were supposed to do and they really put themselves or their organization or even their country at risk. Uh, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember the Equifax uh, hacking a couple of years ago, and it, it was um, 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 information being stolen from a scoring company, Equifax, uh, and this company worked with bank and insurance companies and, and so on. But there were uh, roughly 143 millions of uh, data from people, 143 people had their information being stolen because for various reasons, but one was the fact that somebody didn't do the, the 
protection, um, getting the patch he was to, supposed to do when he receives the information to do it. But there were a, a human mistake, um, uh, and, and we have a behavior here which led to really uh, putting an organization, an individual, of course, at risk. And therefore, the clear uh, idea here, but it's a little more complex, is to say that all of us, including experts, and um, we do a lot of mistakes with our cybersecurity behavior. I mean, don't think you are the only one. If you do a lot of mistakes, everybody will do or has done tiny mistakes. But the problem here in cybersecurity is the fact that if a tiny mistake could be a huge mistake, it's really basically like forgetting to your key on your front door and your key is still there and then somebody could just enter. And then here is an example of somebody saying, okay, I have an antivirus, but it's expired. Okay, therefore it means that it's worth less. Okay. And the person in this case don't really know if having the la latest version is important, but we have an example of, of really uh, weak, uh, um, uh, if I could call uh, in terms of quality behavior of a, of, of a student. And for example, and um, when I have time, I will update, maybe during the holidays. Okay, well, when you read that thing, you may feel that that's fine. I mean, this is a person who, who is grading uh, the software, key software as an application from time to time. So do I. Okay, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> this is wrong. <laughs> because if you have your uh, uh, software requiring you to uh, upgrade, just have a look. Uh, if it's really essential, but very often it's really to protect yourself and you have to do it right away, if, especially if it's, we have a new patch to protect uh, your operating system, for example. Another example, and we add that thing many times, is people forgetting to have any backup. I mean, well, listen to me carefully. If you don't have any backup of your computer, that's the time tomorrow to rush to the, the, the first door and get a backup. But I, by backup, I mean a tool which costs not much money, but may protect your information. Because if you do a backup, and people may do a backup every week, sometimes every month, and the people who have very important data, most of us, actually, and all of us, will have different backup. But in this case, what is very interesting is we, the student who say that thing, I have not had for, no time for any backup, was a computer uh, science student. And uh, of course, it doesn't take time, okay? And since it doesn't take much time, the excuse is not valid. But in this case, the person is really, really at risk. Then, if you have such uh, people, and, and and I include myself and, and, and my family doing some mistakes from time to time, so the the question we have it, but how can we explain these tiny mistakes that could be enormous? Then the first of the the first answer that could come to our mind will be that the people uh, will have um, a good perception of the risk. Actually, it's a little more complex. Is in this matrix you see it's likelihood versus severity, which basically means that if people think that um, the cyber risk could be extremely frequent, plus if they have, for example, an attack, the severity will be used. They are at the in the red red part of the square, and they have to be really really careful. Okay, and then therefore, if people have this feeling of high likelihood, high severity, they are certainly, we could imagine, going to have uh, a good cybersecurity behavior. I mean, they may take care, I mean, they, may do, do, they may not do everything, but they will watch out about what they do on the internet, for example, or back up and so on. Okay, well, the problem is most of the students, not all, not all, but a lot of students at least, say to us that they didn't feel that they, they were threats. They didn't feel that they were subject to an attack in terms of frequency. They didn't feel that the severity will be high. Then if it's an explanation that perceiving threats as a high level 
we didn't see that in much. And therefore, that thing could not be really a driver in changing the behavior of people regarding the cyber security. Okay. Is there another example? Another concept, sorry, is neutralization. I mean, the previous one, I will say, is uh, very intuitive. You can find it by yourself and thinking, okay, well, I will protect myself about anything if I feel there is a risk. This concept of neutralization is not really common, but it's a very common um, um, concept in criminology. And I remember uh, interviewing myself a couple of years ago. A guy, he was selling uh, weapons all over the world and to poor countries. And he was explaining to me how bribery was useful, all right, perfect. And uh, I, I don't remember the question I asked him, but um, he immediately said, I'm not a criminal. And I thought, well, what does he think he's doing? And bribing to sell weapons to poor countries and doing a lot of money is not a criminal. I mean, it's forbidden in this country. It's forbidden in, in the developing countries. What is he talking? Actually, this guy was neutralizing is feeling of guilt. And then neutralization is a concept which has been used in criminology to explain how people don't feel guilty of being involved in crimes. And basically the explanation of the, of the colleagues working on this concept in, in basic criminology like burglary, but also in cyber crime, will say that people will develop an argumentation to really feel guilt, less guilty. And you feel if you feel less guilty, you continue. Like this guy in this case, he, he was bribing, but he had no feeling of guilt, and he was continuing without any, any problem in, in, in his mind in terms of identity. Then we have here an example of what I would call protective neutralization. It's not criminal neutralization of not feeling guilty of being a criminal. It's, of course, here not feeling guilty of not protecting yourself. And we could call that thing protective neutralization. And this is somebody who say, okay, uh, if they were, I don't need to change my behavior. And it's a deny of an injury, it's a deny of the risk. And you, as you see here, it's a little bit of link with what I say previously about perceived threat. But here it's a step forward where people make a connection and uh, uh, with their behavior, plus they feel less guilty and they really develop this argumentation. And in, in the, um, and people will speak about a neuristic, an argumentation well developed, where at the end you feel less guilty of not protecting yourself. There was another one which I, I, I enjoy, also, also as a verb team, and it's a deny of injury. And, uh, whether, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, I have nothing to lose because I don't have anything important. Yes, you do have something important. It's your privacy, your personal information. But what is very strange is the person is really convinced of that. And therefore, the person will not be really protecting him or herself. And then also at the same time, through the process of neutralization, will not feel guilty at all. And what is interesting in this research, uh, and uh, I don't know if it's specific to the students, but definitely we had that thing many times. And at the beginning, really to be honest with you, the first uh, transcript I saw, I thought it's a job. But when I see it rep being repeated again and again, I thought this is really a, a, a systematic kind of answer to my research question, which is conflicting goals. And basically it's the idea of people saying, okay, Cyber security is a task. And I cannot do this task because I don't have enough time or because I don't have enough money. And there were conflicting goals between I would like to protect myself, but it takes so much time. And in this case, the war life, okay, I don't expect you to spend your war life downloading an antivirus, but if you feel so, you will not protect yourself because there is this conflict of force. And some authors will call that thing the response cost, which I find also uh, quite um, uh, um, uh, clear in terms of explaining that uh, responding to the risk uh, could have a high cost in terms of money or time. And if you consider high response cost, you may therefore not really protect yourself. Okay. Um, uh, 
In criminology, there is another concept, which is guardianship, Then you may not be familiar with this one, and uh, like notarization, and I mentioned before, and, um, uh, and you may not be familiar, but you have seen uh, uh, the result of the guardianship research. And, uh, and um, when the colleagues will discover or will, yeah, will discover the concept of guardianship uh, a few years ago now, and they were using that thing for uh, burglary, burglary in, um, in, uh, in basic burglaries. And they, I, they, they try to explain well, why some streets had, had more um, uh, crimes and other less. And they really realized that you need three things. First, of course, a target. Second, an offender, somebody willing really to steal some money or belongings in your house. Plus, and the final one is important, guardianship. People or tools or anything who are going to protect you. And the idea of guardianship could be used to cybersecurity, but you have seen that thing in, in your neighborhood, and it's exactly the result of this research. When actually they realize that if the burglar realizes that there are some guardianship people looking around, they may be less willing to do a crime. Applied to cybersecurity, it's uh, uh, what we call social guardianship. When people are giving us advices in order for us to protect, you know, uh, in this case, our cybersecurity. And yeah. we find many, many, many students who say to us, yeah, well, uh, uh, I do protect myself, but thanks to my mother, my father, my uncle, whoever, who gave me uh, some advice. And then guardianship is also a good explanation. Another uh, concept, and I will, have, I will, I will finish with, with okay. this one, okay. is self-efficacy. And uh, I, I would like to stress this one because it's very important for me to stress this one at the end. When we do think that we could do it, we are more likely to do it. Basically, don't feel like cybersecurity is complicated. At our level, let's say normal people, you don't need to be an expert. You have to do some basic things. And if you believe that it's not going to be too, too much time consuming and not too expensive, you will do it and you will succeed to protect yourself. And this is the reverse. Somebody thinking, I'm, I will not really be able to do that thing. And it's really self-efficacy or inefficacy is really a key driver in cybersecurity behavior. And uh, just to finish, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, risk, the evaluation of threats may not be the explanation in explaining the cybersecurity behavior. We have a little bit of protective neutralization where people deny the injury. It's also what we call the defense of necessity. We got also quite strong conflicting goals between time and cost, and two drivers push in the right direction social guardianship and self-efficacy. Okay, thanks for your attention. Wonderful, thank you, Bertrand. We're already yeah. running short on time, so I'm just gonna squeeze in one, I wanna take at least one question from the audience. So if okay. you could try to, you could try to, um, try to uh, my, my rather quickly, um, this question. In matters related to cybersecurity, is it really fair to say, let users beware? What do we expect users to buy? I'm sorry, why do we expect users to buy the new antivirus and anti malware and four of other security software? Should we think along the lines of OS accountability, device manufacturers accountability, et cetera? Well, um, well it's true that, um, it, well, if, if we talk about students, many uh, universities and uh, higher education do provide uh, antivirus for free, okay? And then the students are sometimes, at, it's a compulsory for them if they want to serve the internet at the university to have this one antivirus. Then for them, let's say in most of the case, they, they don't have much choice and it's really required. For the others, uh, I will not give any, any name of bronze, but definitely there are some free one and it's better than nothing. Then just go on the internet, so to talk to people who are really expert and they would give you advices, okay, you should try this one. 
And uh, what will be the risk is definitely that when you have an antivirus, the antivirus is really got the access to your own information. Then you need to take your time before deciding which one you will use. Uh, but first, I advise you to do so. It's better, much better than having nothing, okay? And second, second, uh, obviously update your antivirus. But if I want really to stress the importance of having such uh, technical tool, and we, we could call also physical guardianship in this case, uh, let's imagine that you are thinking of protecting your house and you think, should I have an alarm? Because if I have an alarm, I'm giving my password to the company in charge of the security. They will know when I'm not here. They will have the video to look at what I'm doing at home. That's right. That's right. Then uh, there is a risk there. But be careful. But at the same time, definitely it's better than nothing. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Okay. And sorry we can't get to all the questions. We're going to try to stick to the timetable here and, and go through these talks every, every 20 minutes. We're already a little over on time. However, um, Bertrand is going to be... Um, circulating a survey. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, contributing to his, some of his research, uh, we're going to be circulating that a bit later in the week. So after this, um, uh, tomorrow we'll be posting the event on our YouTube channel. We'll post it on um, various um, social channels. And also we'll um, include a link in some of our communications, um, hopefully, uh, to that survey so you can get in touch and follow up. OK, wonderful. Thanks again. OK, I'm going to pass it on. I'm going to. Um, uh, Iman, I'm going to make you the presenter now, mm -hmm. and I'll let you uh, get set up there. Uh, so do you hear me and see the presentation? Loud and clear. Take it away. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, first, uh, thanks for the event organizers, and thank you all for coming. Uh, as you might already know, my name is Iman, and uh, today I will be talking about uh, negotiation transparency and consistency in configurable protocols. So uh, I'm interested about uh, negotiation, which is uh, always perceived as a critical phase in politics and business protocols. It's just as important in communication security protocols. Uh, in the latter, the term negotiation uh, usually refers to the process of exchanging security-related parameters between the communicating parties in order to reach a mutual agreement on an optimal parameter. Uh, these parameters can be a protocol version, can be uh, an algorithm for uh, encryption, for hashing, for authentication, can be a set of algorithms which is also known as cipher suite or key-related parameters. And uh, they are important because they define uh, the security guarantees that the protocol can provide in a particular session. Um, negotiation is especially important in uh, widely used protocols that are deployed in a wide variety of devices that vary in their capabilities, such as uh, personal computers versus mobile devices versus embedded devices. And one very famous example of such protocols is the transport layer protocol, uh, which is known as TLS which is used to secure internet communications and email communications. So it's used almost by everyone who uses the internet. Uh, and um, uh, let me uh, now uh, to explain the problem that uh, we are addressing um, at a very abstract level. Let's assume that we have a protocol that supports three parameter, parameters with parameter one uh, has the highest uh, security guarantees and parameter three has uh, lowest security guarantees. So when we have uh, two parties, such as client and server, that support uh, the highest parameter if they agreed on it uh, in the negotiation phase, so we call this an uh, optimal negotiation. Uh, if we have a less capable device, such as embedded web server in, uh, let's say, a uh, wireless access point that doesn't support the highest parameter, so uh, when both parties agree on parameter two, we still consider this an optimal because this is uh, the highest parameter that both parties support. Uh, however, the problem is when we have two uh, parties that support the highest parameter, but they end up agreeing on a less than uh, the highest uh, parameter, such as parameter three, we call this less than optimal negotiation or a downgrade, uh, despite the reason that resulted in this case. Uh, now, let me move from uh, these abstract examples to uh, concrete uh, real-world examples of uh, negotiation, which is the cipher suite negotiation in the TLS protocol. 
which is based on the protocol specifications, uh, works as follows. The client proposes a list of Cypher suites ordered by preference, and the server selects one of these uh, Cypher suites and impose its choice to the client, and the rest of the communication proceeds with the server's choice. So we uh, made a few observations in this uh, negotiation. Uh, first, there is an imbalanced power between the two parties in this negotiation, where uh, the server is uh, clearly a dominant party. Uh, its parameters are not given to the client, and also the algorithm uh, implementation uh, is also not uh, clear to the client. They are black books from the client's perspective. So when the client receives parameter three, but it prefers parameter one, the client has no uh, way of verifying why this is the case. Is it because of the server's maximum capabilities or is it because of something else such as misconfigurations, discrimination, malware, or bad implementation that resulted the server to uh, behave in an unexpected way? We call this uh, negotiation model a server dominant negotiation model. Uh, most of the existing work that uh, have looked at downgrade attacks uh, in uh, security parameters have looked at the problem from a single perspective, where they always assume that the attacker is a man in the middle who will tamper with the parameters to convince one or both parties that they don't support the highest parameter. They also assume that the server will always behave correctly and honestly. Uh, now, the importance of the authenticity and integrity of these uh, messages uh, of the negotiation has become clear. However, uh, other properties such as transparency and consistency and other attacker models have been uh, largely overlooked in the existing lit literature. And in my research, I try to bridge this gap. So I ask questions such as, are there unexplored uh, attacker models that uh, result in a downgrade? Um, so a second question is, uh, um, can a semi-trusted server uh, uh, discriminate against its client without being detected? Uh, this question uh, related to transparency. Uh, the third question is related to consistency. I ask, uh, can two clients' requests to the same server receive inconsistent security guarantees? So, uh, okay. So, uh, with respect to uh, the first uh, question, uh, I introduce uh, a novel attacker model that is called discriminatory attacker model. Uh, based on our observation of the uh, uh, server dominant negotiation model, technically speaking, uh, there isn't anything that prevents uh, the uh, server from behaving in a discriminatory fashion, where it can provide uh, one client with parameter three and uh, a second client with parameter one, and uh, with today's technologies such as web browsers, for example, such behavior will not be detected. As to why uh, the client might behave in this way uh, or the server might behave in this way, well, um, it can uh, be colluding with or compelled by a powerful third party. Um, is this a realistic model? Uh, well, uh, it is inspired by real life events such as the export grade cryptography deprecated law, which uh, mandated uh, um, weaker cryptography uh, for uh, uh, any cryptographic products, including uh, software and browsers, for example, that are exported outside uh, the US. Also, it is inspired by the PRISM Alleged program that is uh, disclosed by uh, Edward Snowden, which also suggests that uh, some giant companies might be uh, colluding uh, or um, colluding uh, with uh, power to, uh, powerful third uh, parties. So uh, now let me move to the second question that in, uh, investigate transparency. Uh, and uh, in this uh, um, uh, to answer this question, I had a, a case study on the forward secrecy property and the transport layer security protocol. And forward secrecy property at a very high level, it's a security property in key exchange algorithms, which uh, provides stronger resilience against uh, mass surveillance, for example. And uh, uh, the question that I ask in the empirical study is, do servers that select non-forward secure support forward secure cipher suites? And uh, I ask this, this question because such misconfiguration, if, if such misconfiguration can go unnoticed, then in the same vein, discrimination can go unnoticed. 
where servers can provide a weaker security guarantees than what they already uh, what uh, they actually support. So uh, I implemented a TLS client that mimic a web browser, uh, but unlike a web browser that will um, uh, enforce the default Cypher suite list, which range from uh, 16 to 20 Cypher suites on most uh, mainstream browsers today. And uh, the browsers will accept whatever answer the um, uh, server will provide them. We implemented an additional heuristic that will examine the selected Cypher suite by the uh, server. And in our case, because we are interested in forward secrecy, if uh, we look for forward secrecy, if it's not there, we uh, immediately follow our first uh, handshake with a second handshake. But this time, we reconfigure the client to only offer forward secrecy Cypher suites. So we leave the server with no choice but to select uh, forward secrecy or drop the connection. And most servers are implemented in a way that they will submit to a strict behavior from the uh, client. So uh, if they selected forward secrecy now and uh, they haven't selected it in uh, the first uh, attempt, we know that they support forward secrecy, but they haven't selected it. I will skip the third. Uh, uh, the third uh, step in the heuristic because it's outside the scope of this um, uh, presentation. Uh, so we uh, did this test in over than 10 million uh, web server address from three data sets, uh, top domains and random domains and random IPs. And uh, indeed, uh, we found such behavior. Uh, it is in its lowest, uh, like 5% uh, in the top domains, and it gets increased in the uh, random domains to up to quarter of the uh, IP address, uh, random IPs to up to quarter of the random IPs. And uh, this is mainly because um, random IPs contains a larger uh, percentage of embedded web servers. So uh, the percentage uh, is influenced by this fact. Uh, and when we make uh, the second test of those percentages uh, or devices in the first line, uh, we found a shifted paradigm where the random IPs uh, ranked the lowest and the percentage increased in the top domains. And uh, we uh, conclude that um, such misconfigurations is more uh, prevalent in uh, uh, ordinary web servers, such as top domains and random domains, and it is uh, not, uh, uh, not prevalent in embedded uh, web devices, which we uh, found uh, a lot of them in the random IPs uh, datasets. Um, now I move to the uh, examining uh, consistency. And uh, I ask if two clients uh, can uh, receive uh, inconsistent security guarantees. And I look at uh, a case study uh, from a multi-regional uh, perspective. And uh, what we did is we uh, rented uh, five uh, devices in five countries, UK, US, India, Australia, and uh, Brazil. And we made a connection to the same domain uh, approximately at the same time. And we look at the response. And we look, we count the inconsistent response. And by inconsistent, we mean uh, one or more, but not all of the responses have a weakness indicator. And um, we did this for uh, 250K uh, domains um, from a top domain uh, the, uh, list. Uh, and uh, these are the weakness indicators um, that we define. Uh, some of them are related to URL security. Some of them are related to security headers and others to TLS security. So we looked at HTTPS from various layers, uh, such as the application layer, the first two uh, vectors for the application, and the second, uh, the uh, third for the uh, transport layer security. So we see that uh, the, uh, the inconsistency is not a prevalent issue, but uh, it exists. Uh, we find hundreds of cases in each uh, vector that we examine. Um, if we look uh, closer at one of the most uh, striking uh, inconsistency, which is the weakness indicator of plain HTTP, which uh, means that one or more, but not all of the responses are sent of, uh, over plain HTTP, which means no security at all, while others are sent over HTTPS. So in this case, uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, this case uh, is uh, uh, due to uh, government blocking uh, in India, for example. So the blocking page is sent, it, uh, sent over uh, HTTP while the US uh, website is uh, over HTTPS. 
other reasons can be uh, due to some some laws where websites are closing in some countries uh, because uh, they don't comply to their uh, uh, laws such as this website in the UK we also find a blocking but for other reason are sent over HTTP we find also some uh, websites uh, normal not uh, blocking uh, webs uh, not a blocking pages and the uh, website is operating such as this shopping website but it is sent over HTTP in UK while it is over HTTPS in the uh, US and clearly, uh, I, I could intercept uh, traffic, for example, this delivery calculator. If I entered my postcode, I can see it uh, sent over uh, clear text in the network. And with that, I conclude uh, that we introduce transparency and consistency as needed properties in configurable protocols. And we show that they are not perfectly achieved in widely used protocols today, such as TLS and HTTPS. We do not claim that we found ongoing discrimination. However, we provide evidence of lack of transparency and consistency. And what we say is that if misconfigurations can go unnoticed today, uh, we only figured out these issues of inconsistency, lack of inconsistency and lack of transparency because if we did heuristics and experiments, but with a normal web browser, this will not be discovered. We say that uh, such uh, misconfiguration uh, in the same way as this misconfiguration can go unnoticed today, discriminations can also can go unnoticed, and therefore empowering clients with means of verifiability is worthwhile. Uh, if you are interested uh, for more details, uh, I invite you to look at our publications uh, in SecureCom 2019 and also in Computers and Security Journal in 2020. And uh, with that, I thank you for listening, and if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Lightning talk indeed, that was a lot of information, a lot to absorb. Uh, if you have any links you wanna drop, let any of those publications, feel free to do that in the chat so people can follow up. Um, I do have thank one question. This is, um, this is from Attila, and the question is, um, first a comment, it would be interesting to see a global map showing the location of the tested servers. Do you know, do you know which continent, you talked about sort of interceptions between continents, do you know which continent is the most vulnerable, is, is there a continent that's most vulnerable to TLS? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the inconsistencies that I showed in this uh, uh, slide, uh, uh, that I, as I showed you, I, we have defined uh, uh, several weakness indicators. Uh, so uh, we looked at inconsistency, uh, like in, uh, in, in, in overall, uh, like uh, if, if one or more countries uh, showed the weakness indicator, we count this inconsistency. Uh, I don't have uh, uh, the statistics of per country uh, in a publishable format, but I have a rough idea, like I, I also looked whether there is one uh, or more uh, countries uh, that dominate uh, this uh, this inconsistency uh, but uh, if if you are concerned about this this is not the case uh, almost all countries have contributed in a way uh, or another there are variations but almost every country have contributed in this inconsistency uh, and also i will um, probably avoid uh, uh, generalization because the TLS or HTTPS is very complex and there are loads of parameters. We selected uh, some of them that we perceive as important, uh, but we didn't, of course, uh, cover everything. So I, I wouldn't uh, generalize that HTTPS is weak. If I would uh, share or like uh, show each country uh, share of these weaknesses, it will be per, uh, per parameter uh, to, to avoid generalizations. Uh, yeah, because okay. a weakness in some header is different from a certificate issues, a header issues and URL issues, every issue is different from uh, the other. Okay, very interesting. Um, okay, fair enough. Well, again, um, I'd like to take another question. Or I do want to keep to the timetable though. We have just 13 minutes till seven and we, we're not gonna end right on the hour, but we're gonna try to keep it to close to an hour. So. Without further ado, I think, uh, thank you very much, Iman. I think we're going to move on to Conrad. Uh, Conrad, I'm going to make you the presenter now. All right. Um, mm -hmm. 
Cool. I hope you can see something. Looks good. Does it, does this look good? Excellent. So hi, yeah, I'm I'm my name is Conrad. I'm a yeah, I'm another Oxford researcher. I'm a PhD student at the computer science department at the moment. I'm I look into app tracking. Um what is what is app tracking? Um it comes it comes under many names and I think most of you have come across it. It is um these notices in mobile apps when they ask you know you know please click okay please click yes if you you know agree to sharing data to improve our services to see more relevant ads to um you know um provide you with more personalized services all of these things are indicators of apps using tracking and it me means nothing but collecting data from users from how, how users use mobile apps opening apps closing apps pressing buttons and much more um, and uh, my colleagues um, in my, my research group um, looked at one million android apps to find out how widespread this practice of tracking it um, and they, they, they found that it's everywhere 90 percent of android apps were found to be able to send data to google uh 40 percent to facebook now um that's that's i you know that's interesting um but what's the what's the problem here why is this why is this concerning um and to learn more about this question, I'm going to touch up in a study by the Norwegian Consumer Council. They um, select 10 mobile apps, um, including dating apps, period tracker apps, uh, amongst others, um, who they deemed, you know, should really keep uh, information about the users to themselves. Um, and what they found is that many of these apps actually send out data to many different companies. The worst practices were found in the dating app Grinder. Grinder is a, a, a dating app that is mainly used um, by gay men. And um, what they what they what they found for for this app is that the, this app sent. Uh, exact location, I, well, I appear to have naturally a unique phone ID, age, gender to about 18 companies. Um, I say about 18 because um, it's not that easy. Um, the, the app Grindr um, was found to show um, some particular concerning data practices. Um, many of these other apps that the Norwegian Consumer Council did similar things, except that Grindr uses a practice called real-time bidding. Um, real-time bidding um, is used to um, show users apps, and what happens is that well, it's essentially, it's essentially. Um, you know, it's a, it's a bit, it, it's an auction bidding, it's similar to eBay. What is out for bidding is um, an advertising space on the user's device. Um, and the information the potential advertisers receive is personal data, information about the user, such as location, such as identifier, such as, I don't know, gender, sexual orientation. You know, there's there's really well. It seems like there's nothing that cannot be shared in these uh, bid requests, and um, this means that um, often for to, to serve one single ad, hundreds, if not thousands of companies receive um, data about the user, and this this um, um, figure you see shows. A um, and and uh, and a real-time bidding auction. Um, you see that you know, many companies are contacted. They contact others. 
Um, and this is just an excerpt that doesn't show the full picture. Um, interestingly, the Open Rights Group, um, uh, together with other um, um, groups, is currently taking action against this practice of real time bidding. And um, yeah, well, um, that's because many of these practices are illegal, but we still they, they still take place. So what is it that users can do? What is it you know that I or you can do to um, improve a bit on the on the current situation? Um, and I want to be very honest with you. Um, there's probably not much um, what we can do at the moment because these companies pour lots of resources into collecting data and um, using it for their purposes. However, I've got I've got some hope. I've got some hope that um, there are a few things that you can do, and this is why I'm developing this tracker control app. Um, I think that users de de deserve to know about these practices, uh, which falls under the, the banner of notice. Um, tracker control tries to give users some choice to limit tracking on their devices and also to educate users about their legal rights under data protection law. And I'm going to show you a little, um, little uh, presentation of what my tracker control app does. Um, I hope you can all see this. So tracker control shows you um, yeah, all the apps you've got on your phone, you can select an app and um, yeah, just you know run it and um, then suddenly after after uh, you know just just a few seconds of interaction, you see that data is shared with lots of companies, um, Google, Adobe, Facebook, and even companies you know probably not many of us have heard of such as Lean Plum or, 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 or Branch. Um, you can also see, this takes a bit too low. You can also see the, uh, yeah, this is, this is it. You can also see the, um, the uh, countries that data is sent to, um, the trainer that apparently sends data to the US and Ireland. Um, and lastly, there's a section on data protection rights. Many, again, many of these practices that take place are not legal, um, presumably. And uh, at the same time, users have rights uh, against these data protection practices and um, tracker control tries to provide some information on what are my, what, what are my rights over data? Um, yeah, um, just very quickly, because I think this could be interesting to some of you, um, how does tracker control work? Tracker control uses the Android VPN functionality. It works as a VPN server on the user's device. And uh, this allows to filter out, to detect any suspicious communication from apps um, to the internet. And to detect those suspicious connections, um, tracker control uses the um, uh, very widely used disconnect me block list that is used for tracker protection, Mozilla Firefox, um, as well as um, a uh, list of um, tracker domains and companies that emerge from our own research uh, in studying 1 million Android apps. Um, and um, if you want to give it a shot, feel free to do so. It's available widely on the internet. Um, you know, you can get it. Um, I, I'd, I'd recommend not taking the version from the Play Store. Google doesn't allow certain things on the Play Store. But other than that, um, you know, if you're if you're interested, um, check it out. I'm I'm going to share a link in the um, chat afterwards. And I uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, I would like to hear your questions. Thank you, Conrad. That's really, really interesting. And right up our alley at Open Rights Group, indeed. 
That is so cool. It's an Android app. I wish I could get it. I have a I have an iPhone. Um, that's really really cool. Oh yeah yeah, it's only Android yeah. Uh, that's great though. It's brilliant. And um, so it's available now. I'm just curious. Um, how um, wait, it's it's in continual development, or how how long has it been available publicly? And how long? Half a year, but it's been okay. it's been in development a bit longer. Yeah. Um, yeah, we tested. We also test it with users, and um, yeah, that always gives you know that always um, gives you things you as a researcher, uh, well as an expert, could never think of yourself. So that was really exciting. Very very interesting. Um, oh, well, we do have one question, um, and this is um, more generally about corporate surveillance. So, do you expect an increase in corporate surveillance in the UK? After we've left the European Union, keeping in mind that GDPR is codified into UK law via the Data Protection Act, however, there is going to be a lot of potential for divergence after we leave, mm. uh, particularly with um, one thing Open Rights Group has been really focused on in addition to the um, ad tech uh, complaint that we're doing is, mm. um, is the, the um, digital trade negotiations happening with uh, the United States that could potentially really cause a shift. Um, in the data in the data protection rules uh, potentially uh, in the not too distant mm -hmm. future in the UK do you expect what what do you expect to happen well um Corporate very difficult balance. to say what very very difficult to say what happens after um Brexit I think I think an interesting an interesting thought is uh what would what would what would it mean if things get worse um it seems like things are already pretty outrageous that personal data is massively leaked to companies and this is what you're currently taking legal action against in, in the EU. Um, an important problem in the EU though is that um, it's very difficult to take these cases forward. Many of the companies are based in Ireland and um, um, all, well, well, at least that's the, that's the uh, the, the, the how it usually works is that all the data complain uh, the data protection complaints against Irish based companies such as Google or Facebook have to go through the Irish data protection authority you know who have not been super keen on um, following these requests in the past it took Max Schrems about nine years to um, um, you know stop you know put put you know put an end on Transatlantic data transfer for the moment. Um, so that might be that might be an opportunity for the UK. But uh, Mike, as you rightly say, I guess it depends on you know what legal um, framework the UK has. Uh, at the end of the day, um, without doubt, there's you know that there might be some 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 opportunity for the UK to enforce stronger data protection laws, but you know, future will show that that's that happening. Interesting. Um, thank you. Would you like to weigh in? There's a bit of a echo on your um, mic there, Bertrand, but please go ahead. Would you like to weigh in on that question? Uh, yes. Well, uh, Boris Johnson made clear that uh, the GDPR will be uh, reshaped uh, from a UK perspective. Then. He has made various declarations already, and basically he is going to ease the rules, which means that the protection in terms of data will be less important in the UK after the Brexit. That's really clear. He has said that thing many times. And uh, then we could imagine that if we let corporations do whatever they want, they will still continue to collect as much data as possible because it's a gold mine. I mean, uh, people have to realize, and some of the students didn't realize that how important are their data, but they just let the data flow around as big, big mistakes. And just to answer the question, with the Brexit, uh, it looks like, according to the Prime Minister, it's not my statement, and you could just find what he said a few times already along the virus uh, uh, last month, it's going to be a decline of the of the protection of the data of the people to have a kind of GDPR uh, according to the British uh, way. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And, and what's not clear is um, what's not clear is how the UK is going to reach its um, adequacy decision with the EU and what sort of disruption that could cause cross-border data flows and whatnot after um, we leave the EU. So yes, we're all in a lot of suspense. Um, there is a, a, a question that's come in for you, um, Conrad. Um, can the tracker app be used when there already is a VPN app installed on, on the phone? Unfortunately not, no. Google, um, well, it, it's very difficult to do these things. Uh, it might be possible though in the future. There, there are um, similar apps that have implemented such features and um, I'm definitely working towards making this possible to give even better protection. Okay, and then um, another question for you. Um, for, the, for tracking activity, Conrad, is it better to browse via a browser instead of via a mobile app? Not sure if they mean a browser on a desktop exactly, or I suppose that's a bit unclear. But do you have any um, any response? Is it is it a, yeah? Is it about um, you know whether to use the website or the the mobile app? Maybe is that do you think that is, is that what I the question so. asks? I think so. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think that always you know that cannot be answered in general. What what is um, what is, what is certainly what is certainly interesting is that um, apps often have access to to more sensory information. Uh, websites, you know, especially on the desktop, don't have access to um, I don't know what other program programs are used on your computer. Um, so there's less, you know, at the moment it seems like there's less to be less to be got from in terms of data from from desktop websites but then um, that's that, that 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 really depends on the uh, implementation okay interesting so we're over seven o'clock but i think we can just um maybe do one or two more questions and um well actually i can't resist i have a, a general question I'm, I'm curious to hear if you have any comments any any of the three of you um just in light of what's happened this last week there's been um this breach of uh, Twitter um, at the, some of the highest levels. He's like, you know, Joe Biden and geez, who else was it? Um, was it Elon Musk? I forget. A few very high profile Twitter accounts got hacked. Um, and, you know, presumably these accounts had, had a fair amount of security or special attention by Twitter. And from what I understand, you know, there was, there was a, the, the, the scammer, you know, gained administrative access. Um, you know, and it was very adept at, at fraud. But um, that's my question. What, what, do you, what do you make of that? If, if they can't, if, if, if those kind of accounts can't be protected, is that, does that discourage you at, at all? Any, any response from anyone? For, for me, I just to highlight the importance of the human aspect in security. And uh, many, I, I have heard this comment uh, from many, many, uh, people in uh, like large organizations, uh, they say that uh, the human aspect is, is the most difficult uh, aspect of security, including the usability also, because many of the uh, security issues can be solved uh, with more stricter policies, but also this uh, add loads to the uh, user. And uh, that's why uh, there are some policies um, that are still uh, kind of uh, one size fits all, uh, including what I have discussed in terms of negotiation. They support multiple versions, uh, like the legacy, the, the one pre prior to the newest one, and also multiple cipher suites to kind of uh, um, uh, so, uh, for compatibility uh, and interoperability reasons. Uh, stricter policy can uh, kind of limit uh, such uh, downgrade attacks, but uh, if we uh, think of warning messages, uh, let's say before falling back to a lower version or lower uh, uh, cipher suite, then uh, warning messages uh, are also have uh, a lot of usability concerns uh, with respect to users. If they are too much, then they will be problematic and there will be the uh, what is known as the habitation effect where users get too used to warnings that they don't uh, read them afterwards. So uh, yeah, the usability and the uh, human aspect of security is um, e e extremely crucial, and this event just highlighted this uh, to me and to everyone, maybe. Yeah. 
So true. Yeah, uh, I, I agree also uh, with the fact that this Twitter case uh, is a, a good a good example of how uh, um, mis uh, uh, immune behavior could lead to huge failure. But at the same point, we, in this Twitter case, we had a company with a lot of means and possibilities to protect the data they have, but even then are not able to do it. Okay. Then it, that could uh, employ for people listening to this case. Okay, if a company like Twitter is not able to do so, how could I do it? I mean, but let's really go to the basics. Really try to really be uh, having a good password, the some backup, use a VPN, update update your uh, your application when it's necessary. And be careful also uh, when you find a USB key, you don't plug you the USB key from, an, uh, from somebody you don't know. When you receive an email uh, from somebody you have never, uh, uh, never heard of, you never look at the attachment that you may receive. Some basic rules are very important and are very easy to follow. Then um, uh, even in this case, may I like that big companies do not protect the data we could still do something and we should do something. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I think, I think, um, and probably also um, uh, appealing to your mission at the Open Rights Group, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think, I think this, this, this present year really shows how much uh, power is, uh, lies with a few companies and, um, you know, um, the, the, what you know what consequences it, it can have if things go wrong so um yeah i really wonder if that's you know if that's that's right um and um what would be what would be meaningful alternatives because as as the other speakers have rightly pointed out you know if they can get it right security who who, who should be able to do it so it seems like you know decentralization um might may, may not be the best solution either so what what shall you do? It's interesting because um, the, this incident occurred during the same week that uh, the sort of tech lash against big tech really really hit home in America in a way that it it really previously only had in Europe, um, where you know where you had all these CEOs lined up getting grills at the same time. It wasn't just Mark Zuckerberg. It was you know, and it was a uh, you know all across the political aisle they were they were really um, unhappy with big tech. So this issue of of consolidation is, is coming to a boil from the place where it's originating, you know, mainly. And so that's, I find that interesting. We'll see where that, where that goes um, and what hopefully could uh, cause some change um, in the wind. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one last question for you. Um, it's an interesting question for Conrad. Um, is there a way to sandbox some apps to prevent them from seeing the rest of the content on your phone? So, so I didn't, I missed the first part. Can you, can you um, is there a way to sandbox, to sandbox an app to, um, or some apps oh, to prevent the, 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 from being seen, from, from being, from seeing the rest of the content on the phone? The rest of the, I don't know. I don't quite know what the rest of the content on the phone means. Okay. Uh, like, I suppose a way to isolate the app. It, it, so. um, I, I know, I know of an app that might, might suit this purpose. Um, and that that people in in my privacy community are, are really keen on. Um, it's called Shelter. It's available for Android, and uh, that allows you to define profiles and separate apps from another. Um, it's also it's also interesting to um, think about en how Android or iOS apps work. There seems to be um, quite some more. Uh, integration between apps on Android compared to compared to iOS, but on the other hand, Android apps have more permission management than iOS apps. So um, yeah, it's very interesting thinking about what are the uh, you know what 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 privacy choice is it? What platform I choose for my smartphone? Okay, great. Well, if anyone doesn't have any more comments, I think we can. Leave it there, and we'll stick to just over an hour, um, like we had planned. Um, just want to thank everyone for joining us. It was really great. We hope to have you back uh, anytime, and we're going to try to do this on a more regular basis. 
uh, we sort of ran into the conundrum of, of having local events in our local groups, and then now suddenly they're online, and we're still like, well, we can kind of open it up and, and do them more frequently, and you know, get people who are in Germany to show up and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, why not? So we're looking forward to doing more of these uh, on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, um, we'll post the, um, um, some kind of a video of this tomorrow, and um, I'll include some some links to um, Bertrand's survey, um, Iman's research, uh, maybe to your app, to Conrad's app as well. So, um, and sorry we couldn't sure. get to everyone's questions, but we appreciate everyone who sent them. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thank night. you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye.